I get a fair amount of Kraken Krakoa sleuths sending me theories and links about X-Men, which is a really fun way to see that people are engaging with the comics and with my own obsessing about them. In response to my X-Men Free Comic Book Day 2020 video review and theories about Ten of Swords and the mysterious sword bearers of Morocco, a listener sent me their theory on the classified apparent leader of the bunch. I stored the link away for later, but now that I've looked into it, I'm 98% certain their theory is spot on. I can't for the life of me determine exactly who sent this, so I just want to be clear I take zero credit for unearthing this and want to thank everyone who sends me wild X-Men theories to get my wheels spinning. It is a super fun part of doing this. I'm Dave, you're listening to Crack and Krakoa number 77, a product of Comic Book Herald. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or podcast, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. We're going to go deep on a theory for Ten of Swords, the upcoming X-Men crossover event today, and spoilers for some of the discussed comics will follow. In my Ten of Swords Chapter 1 video, I theorized that the Swordbearer sense titled Classified, for the record, I think it'd be hilarious if that's just her Swordbearer name, she's just named Classified, I theorized that she was Storm. My rationale was first that the half-visible personage of the character on the Eight of Cups is a black woman with all-white eyes, but second that the text ties to Storm's journey. Here's the quote. That which was once the harmonious lifting of voices is now a mocking echo, then silence. Okay, let's think about that. What does that have to do with Storm and kind of where she is in the Dawn of X, particularly in the pages of Giant Size X-Men? Well, in House of X number 5, as we learn about Krakoa's resurrection capabilities, it's Storm who introduces the resurrected X-Men team to the Island of Mutants. This to me signifies her harmonious lifting of voices, literally leading the island in a chant of mutant with each new lineup introduction. We'll know more for sure following Giant Size X-Men Storm number 1, which is going to be the conclusion of the Hickman written Giant Size series, but the mocking echo potentially signifies the Children of the Vault corruption of Storm taking place across the Giant Size specials. A bunch of listeners have been asking why it's a big deal that Storm has 30 days to live following giant size X-Men Jean Grey and Emma Frost, since mutants can just be resurrected now. Aside from the flippant, it still probably sucks to be corrupted by the vault and die, I think the bigger problem here is that Storm is threatened with a kind of infective transformation like death, but not equal to it. It's conceivable to me that the vault's infection could take root, and Storm could be transformed into an enemy, which given her commitment to the X-Men and mutant kind throughout her life and kind of everything she stands for, would be similar to a kind of walking, waking death. Plus, given that the now fully revealed cover of Marauders number 14 is an incredible Russell Dowderman and Matt Wilson depiction of Storm literally dancing with death of Apocalypse of Horsing fame, it remains very possible that my gut instinct was correct and good old classified is in fact Aurora Monroe. Of course, this could also just be a fun allusion to the adage of a dance with death. But, you know, there's a lot of evidence here that helps me stick to my theory. That said, there's an, there's an even better one literally related theory that works so much better and it's that classified is a shake and if i'm pronouncing that horribly wrong apologies to the a s h a k e's of the world if you're not familiar with the character of shaki don't worry i didn't know her by name either uh a shake first appeared in new mutants number 32 i'm just gonna try all the pronunciations and hopefully i hit one of them in 1985 during a saga that found magic and mirage aka danny moonstar transported approximately 5,000 years into the past in ancient egypt Unrelated to this theory, but the issues through around number 34 are pretty interesting for uh, any renewed interest in the Shadow King that you may have. Okay, so approximately one page in one panel, a mysterious sorceress named Ashake appears to the time-lost new mutants and provides them sanctuary. Ileana and Danny are struck by how similar she looks to their X-Men mentor Aurora Monroe, or Storm, and Ashake is able to divine across time that Storm is a future descendant of hers. Wildly, this entire meeting is over in a flash, and she helps Magic and Danny travel back to the future. Naturally, they overshoot the present by, you know, a handful of years, and hijinks ending in an X in Sue. Okay, so it's a very brief meeting, almost throwaway thing, in the pages of New Mutants number 32. It would be a stretch, I think. You know, it's an extraordinarily brief appearance. It would be even more of a deep cut reference if that's all we had. But... Ashaki actually made a return 23 years later in the four-issue 2008 miniseries Mystic Arcania. This is where things really get interesting and compelling. In a flashback story written by Louis Simonson, set during the events of the aforementioned New Mutants number 32, Mystic Arcania Magic number 1 explores the full-fledged adventure Magic and Ashaki experienced in the past in an untold tale. So she's using, you know, what happened in between panels here to tell a new story. A couple thoughts on this right off the bat. 
First, tarot cards play a major role throughout Mystic Arcania, which pretty seamlessly connects possible relevance to the tarot-based upcoming crossover event Ten of Swords. Indeed, the term Arcania is used in the Major Arcana, which re references the 22 trump cards. For our non-card players, no, this has nothing to do with American politics, thank heavens, in a standard 78-card tarot pack. Ashaki quite literally makes her own tarot cards with painted images on sheets of bone. So again, like these are stylistic and symbolic ways that her character could easily connect to what is a, apparently a tarot card based event you know that that style of, of divining things is being integrated here heavily i also love how simonson and the team are able to dig back into this all too brief moment from an issue of new mutants nearly a quarter century in the past and give it new life and breathe new character into Ashake. It's a cool reflection of some of comic book's most unique properties, that these stories and universes are intertwining and connected across decades of real-world time, and that something seemingly is tossed aside as Storm's long-lost great-great-great-great-great etc. grandmother could be a major plot point in the future. In Mystic Arcania, Ileana and Ashake are effectively forced to retrieve the Sword of Bone, one of the four cornerstones of creation, which eventually becomes the Sword of Ashake, as her purity of will is kind of the only thing capable of tapping into the sword's mysterious and very powerful energies. At the conclusion of the four-part mini, Ashaki returns to aid the forces of good and then effectively goes her own way in the mystic dimensions, freeing her up to basically anything any storytellers would want to do next. Things like, oh, I don't know, make her a focal point of Ten of Swords. It's a tangential detail, but I'll also note that in the pages of, of the four-issue Mystic Arcania, uh, the second cornerstone of creation is found in the possession of of Morgan Le Fay, who of course is currently being held experiment slash prisoner by Apocalypse, as he uses her magics to make connections from Otherworld to wherever we're going, whatever dimensions I predict we're hopping to in Ten of Swords. So it's a loose connection there, but again, Morgan Le Fay being involved, it, it does make me wonder, is this the source material? Is this more of an inspiration, particularly in Teeny Howard's Excalibur, than we would have previously thought? Okay, so there are some pretty cool connections here, but a couple major questions remain. First, let's back up a second to look at what we know about the sword bearers of Arako. The most relevant info to date is that the first, first horsemen of Apocalypse are among the sword bearers. And until we knew there were 10 sword bearers, it was my understanding that Apocalypse was primarily planning a rescue mission solely for these four most favored. While it's not just this, a rescue mission for Apocalypse's first horseman is what I've been predicting Ten of Swords would be about literally since it was announced, you know, back at uh, C2E2, the Impossible Con of 2020. In attendance there, you know, as I dug into what do I think is going to happen in Ten of Swords, I thought, okay, it's going to be an Apocalypse rescue mission for the ho first horseman. It's more to it than that, though, because there are 10 classified sword bearers. Intriguingly, while War and Death are named among the sword bearers, Pestilence and Famine are not. Bay the Blood Moon, one of the characters, looks like the character could be one of the four based on the limited images we've seen of the group, but there's been a horseman uh, design with an eyeball head, and that's nowhere to be found on that sword bear page. So whatever the reason, they haven't survived the Eternal War standing in the gap, the character designs have changed since launch, uh, somebody told Hickman and company that, that the eye design was way too similar to Jason Aaron's love for Orb, we know the first horsemen are a part of this group, but most of the group, up to 80%, is from somewhere else. So if classified is Ashake, it's likely she would know Apocalypse, but she is not necessarily one of his first horsemen. I think this is very interesting, given my expectations for what the event would be, and it also raises the question then, what is her relationship to all these characters? For what it's worth, we first meet Ashake during an era of BC ancient Egypt, which doubles as the approximate time frame time frame of the rise of apocalypse in civilization. So I haven't seen any direct interaction, but it's not impossible that they could have met and established a relationship during this time period. My gut feeling though is that Ashake slash classified is not one of the first horsemen. Given her ties to magic and mystical dimensions, she worships the Egyptian goddess Mat, also known as Ashtar, the mother of Agamato, of, of Eye of Fame. So it seems quite believable that her path would have taken her to the mystical realms beyond Otherworld that are converging upon everyone leading up to Ten of Swords, right? That's what we've been seeing as we approach that event. It's also tantalizing to consider that while Ashake may not be a horseman, she could fall into a Mother Akaba type role similar to what we see Moira inhabiting in her ninth life, as revealed in the pages of Powers of Ten. Tying it all back to the character's appearance on the Tarot Eight of Cups tease in the Free Comic Book Day special, the Eight of Cups' most common interpretation effectively boils down to a rousing rendition of the clashes, should I stay or should I go? She's been in limbo fighting for who knows how long, and now she actually gets to make a choice, right? So 
Again, we don't know the circumstances necessarily that brought Ashake to to you know this limbo, this this dimensional kind of hellscape where she is now a part of the Swordbearers. But the Eight of Cups is suggesting that she has a decision to make now, and she can either stay in this realm or she can go. And what that's going to mean, of course, will become apparent in Ten of Swords. But I think everything there that I've just laid out, boiling together, really adds up to her possible presence in this book. Here's a bonus theory: a Ten of Storms that may yet pass, if you will. A variation on this theory that I'm quite proud of is that the classified lead sword bearer is in fact Storm, but from a different future. And this would be the sorceress Storm that Ileana thought she killed in Limbo during the Magic 4 issue miniseries, which I believe came out it was mid-80s, I'm going to guess 83, 84 era. Now this one's written by Chris Claremont in a, a crucial story for Ileana Rasputin. So the story of Magic, Ileana, it's timey-wimey and complicated, and I've recapped it elsewhere on Crack and Krakoa, but the general idea is that a version of the X-Men that traveled to the realm of Limbo were stuck behind, including a version of Storm who grew older and became a fairly advanced sorceress. This storm rescues Ileana from Belasco's hellish clutches for a time and teaches her, or attempts to teach her, some of the magic she knows to try and, and help her. Ultimately, Ileana is kind of forced to kill Storm in order to prevent her soul from being taken by the Elder Gods, right? It's a classic mentor-mentee kind of relationship. No, that, that never happens, but it happens here. Limbo, though, timey-wimey as hell. And it would be more than possible to bring Limbo Storm back through magic time shenanigans. Plus, like, okay, Ileana, we think killed her, but how many times we've seen a character, you know, we thought killed actually still around? This feels like the best of both worlds possible theory and outcome to me because it ties in Limbo, Ileana, and Storm heavily to Ten of Swords, all of which, of course, helps pave the way to a good old Inferno 2.0 event coming in 2021. I've been feeling, obviously, not just me, because Inferno has literally been teased in those sinister secrets, but I think we're, we're on the map here towards an Inferno 2.0 event. That theory would drive us there, I think, pretty heavily. So there you have it, my theory for what we'll be seeing in Ten of Swords, who classified will be, and the relation to Storm and the X-Men. You know, an extra detail here that comes on the heels of reading Excalibur number 11 this week uh, is Storm's ties to the external Chondra. Uh, it's a weird, weird sort of, of symbiosis there where the Chondra, I, I don't know that I need to go into the externals thing, I just did it in my crack in Krakoa on Excalibur number 11, that issue, but uh, Storm stole one of the, the eternal externals, excuse me, uh, gems full of their power. Had that for years. We, we learned that in X-Men number 60 and 61, okay? So bringing the externals into all this, Apocalypse's connections to them, could that use of that stone give Storm yet another reason why she would have ties to Otherworld? Is that a huge reach I just made up on the fly? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely it is. But, uh, you know, that, that's what I do here. That's what Kraken Co is, right? So, all right, I've got a list here of the comics that uh, were most essential in putting this together if you are so interested uh you can do some reading there obviously you can screenshot that slide or i'll throw these issues in the show notes should i remember if you like comic book herald and the crack and Krakow series and other things i do you can support the site over patreon.com slash comic book herald i in particular want to shout out our mysterious benefactors this is everybody who supports the site at the ten dollar a month level uh for at least uh one month time thank you so much for doing so jeff zacharias ron paul kirkley jesse w robert mickelson and professor pride steve brennan Cole Weathers, Martin Lopez, Chris Isidro, and Darren Clark. You are some awesome, mysterious benefactors. So while I'm here, if you made it all the way in, you're still listening. Uh, up next, I'm trying to do these big weekend crack and Krakoa questions. I've got some ideas. I've got some thoughts. But if you have theories of your own first, I want to hear them in the comments. Uh, just comment here on this video in general. Obviously, is greatly appreciated. But if you've got ideas or questions that you want to see me explore in a future crack in Krakoa, uh, let me hear it and, and let me know what you're looking for. And I will uh, choose from some of the best ones and hopefully be able to integrate them and talk about them over time on the show. So thanks so much. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com, at comicbookherald, pretty much anywhere online. And you can look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for more from me. But leave your comments, leave your theories. I want to hear them. And otherwise, everybody, uh, thanks for listening and enjoy the comics.